Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan Cohen, the Executive Director of Conciliation Resources. Uh, before we get into tonight's event, I would like to just give a little bit of uh, three housekeeping pieces of information. The first is to say that today's event is scheduled to run for an hour and a quarter. So it'll finish in UK time at 7.15, but I know we've got friends and colleagues joining from many different time zones. So I'll, I'll let you do the maths for yourselves. Um, secondly, uh, we'll be recording the event so that hopefully people who've not been able to make it will be able to share the conversation that we have. And thirdly, we'll have some question and answers. So please do feel free to put some questions in the, in the comments box. And after about 45, 50 minutes, we'll, we'll turn to questions that, that you've been posing and, and things you'd like to find out about. Okay, well, hopefully we've now been joined by most people who'll be coming online with us. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to the first in an event series that Conciliation Resources are organizing called See the Human. Uh, the purpose of this series is to highlight the realities of living with conflict and of building peace. We're looking forward to hearing from people with direct experience of bringing about change in some of the world's most complex and difficult conflict contexts. Um, first, before we get into the discussion itself, I'd like to say a few words about conciliation resources. We're an international organization that's committed to stopping violent conflict and creating more peaceful societies. We work in more than 15 countries around the world and we've been doing this for more than 27 years now. Um, we've been working directly with people impacted by war and by violence, working to bridge divides and to influence the way in which peace is made in societies and countries that are torn apart by violent conflict. From supporting the signing of peace agreements in countries like the Philippines and Ethiopia, to facilitating agreements at local levels between farmers and herders in a number of West African countries, or ensuring that women and young people are able to have a say in the conflicts affecting them, we work to change the way the world responds to violent conflict. And we do this with more than 80 partner organizations run by courageous men and women facing profound challenges on a daily basis. Whether it's from what we see on the television screens or direct and personal experience of violence, we're all aware that wars are complex and brutal. In the face of this, building peace is far from straightforward and it's painstaking. I've learned personally that building peace is not just about politics and it's not just about high level negotiations, as important as these are, but it's about ordinary, or in fact, should I say extraordinary people and the steps that they're willing to take to confront violence and change their societies. With our See the Human series, we want to highlight the challenges and the realities experienced by so many people, whilst also shining a light on the work being done by courageous men and women around the world to build peace. So to that end, I'm absolutely delighted to have Yalda Hakim and Emma Leslie with us today. Um, many of you will know Yalda's work uh, with the BBC World Service and particularly her reporting from Afghanistan. Indeed, I hope you'll have seen her extraordinary panorama documentary from last summer called The Return of the Taliban. Emma Leslie's a, a longtime friend and colleague of myself in Conciliation Resources. She's the director of the Center for, for Peace and Conflict Studies in Cambodia and is deeply involved in work in Myanmar and the Korean Peninsula and the Philippines, where she's worked very closely with us at Conciliation Resources in, for more than a decade now in, in helping to support peace there. So Yalda, I'd like to turn to you and could you tell us a little bit about your background and, and how that has shaped your work as a journalist in conflict regions? Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. Um, really, in many ways, I think in the conversations I've had with you, uh, I've realized that um, the work that I do as a journalist and the work that many of us journalists do, uh, it really uh, complements much of the work that you do um, at your organization and that your teams focus on. So uh, my job as a journalist and what I've been doing for over 15 years now is to really go to some of these places where 
uh, people are impacted by conflict um, and and face uh, you know horrific horrific things. Whether that's in South Sudan or Yemen, um, I spent a lot of time. Um, almost 17 months going in and out um, of northern Iraq um, to cover the, the rise and fall of the so-called Islamic State and the impact on the local populations there, whether that was the Yazidi community um, or, or various other communities, the Kurds, um, the the uh, the Iraqi population themselves uh, across the country who were impacted by uh, the, the conflict that was ongoing there. But much of my work in, in the last um, perhaps six months um, has been focused on Afghanistan. I've been covering Afghanistan for uh, 15 years since the beginning of my career. I, I did one of my first documentaries out of Afghanistan. It's also the country of my birth. Um, I was born there and my family left Afghanistan when I was six months old. I was raised uh, in Australia and uh, that's where I was trained as a journalist. And then I uh, was um, more or less poached by the BBC and, and I came to uh, to London. and and. The one thing that I can pride myself on is that we continue with the BBC to shed light on stories that aren't necessarily sexy. They don't necessarily bring in uh, the ratings, um, but they're important stories. They need to be told. And uh, they're really the stories behind the headlines that we focus on. And so I've spent um, really much of the, the uh, last six months, 12 months, focusing on um, what's been going on in the country of my birth, in Afghanistan. I, I was there just several weeks before the fall of Kabul, and I continued to cover it throughout the summer. And um, I'm really proud to say that the BBC has stuck with the story and virtually every day on my program um, on uh, World um, TV, uh, we cover some element um, to do with what's going on in Afghanistan. So today uh, we did the story about the abduction of two women, female protesters, activists who were out on the streets of Kabul um, on Sunday and then they were threatened by the Taliban. We also had the Taliban on the show today denying those um, uh, that they were behind the abduction. So, you know, we're having these conversations every day, um, whether it's it's about peace or the conflict or, um, you know, how uh, those two sides can come together and have some kind of dialogue about the misunderstandings and, and, the, and the horrors that are taking place there. That's the job that I currently have. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to the conversation tonight. Well, well, thanks so much for sharing that, Yadra, and we'll dig into a number of those issues as, as we go along. But before we do that, I'd like to turn to Emma and, and hear from you, Emma, about what motivated you to become involved in peace building. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, maybe by contrast to Yalda, actually, um, our connecting um, fact there being Australia, but I grew up in a rural um, country town in um, an isolated part of Australia. and very acutely remember in uh, when I was eight years old actually seeing what we called at the time starving Kempicheans on the television and remembering my mum um, saying sit up at the table now and eat your dinner don't watch that and that sort of anomaly of um, growing up in a privileged space a privileged environment but also um, in a family that was very faith-based and so all of those narratives that come through um, growing up in a in a Christian environment, led me down a path to an ecumenical environment, um, and then finally a more interfaith focus. And I had the privilege early on of being able to travel to places like Timor-Leste, to Myanmar, um, and by 1997 to Cambodia. And little did I know that 25 years later, here I am still in Cambodia, um, now proudly a Cambodian citizen, um, but continuing to work on peace processes around the Asia region. And maybe very critical to that is um, an, a focus or a intention that we use places like Cambodia as a learning centre for other places that have experienced violent conflict. So that sort of time from the starving Kampucheans, which was sort of the end of the genocide in Cambodia through to civil war, through to a peace process, um, UN's forces, um, later on the integration of the Khmer Rouge into the, into the national government, all of that story has such a rich amount of learning. And so the Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies and all of the work that we do grounds in Cambodia precisely so that we can share that experience. And so we've been happy to have Afghans and Burmese people, people from different ethnic groups, 
the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, I think we're going to speak a bit about um, people from North Korea, South Korea coming together here in an unexpected place like Cambodia, where we can really, yeah, have a safe space and a place that we can connect, but in a place that feels familiar and humble and and a space of empathy and dialogue. So, so here I am, white Australian, still aware of the issues Australia has and its own trauma, but I'm happy to be here as part of the Cambodian community and family. Well, well, thanks, Emma, and fascinating to hear those connections over time. And, and I think the comparative dimension, and indeed, I remember what some five years ago, we were together in Cambodia with a group of people from Afghanistan trying to think through how they could chart a, a way towards peace. And clearly, recent months have shown us that, that that was not successful in ways we would have hoped. And I think what you've both shared so far, I mean, there's so much we can we can talk about. And perhaps three themes that I think will run through our conversation will be around how do you go about promoting dialogue and, and reporting on conflict in the face of some very real security challenges? Um, how do we think about the experience of people who are affected by violence? And how do you connect with them, both as a journalist, as a peace builder, and the emotional connection and the empathy that you build and yet the the importance of detachment in in the work that you do but i think one of the critical questions for me is how do you actually go about doing your work in oppressive contexts where you see so much violence and and maybe i'll kick off with a question to you emma because we hear a lot about peace processes mediation negotiations in in our world and and those are central to what we do in our work and central often to what you cover as a journalist Yalda, but what does it mean to actually work for peace in a society where there's been persistent violent conflict? And, and what is it you're trying to achieve? Big question, Jonathan, to kick us off. <laughs> I, think, um, I think one of the important things is to desegregate violence and conflict. And violence is obviously the thing that comes out of people's frustrations of being excluded, left out, put aside, discriminated against because of their ethnicity or religion or gender or whatever else. And so part of what I think we do as peace builders is to first try to analyze that is what is driving um, these tensions, this obvious clash of political views or um, ethnic or, or religious views or whatever. And secondly, then to really look at what can we do to try and bridge that or to address that. And so in conflicts like Myanmar, as we've seen this year, um, there is a big issue around democracy, but there's equally an issue around um, 70 years of different ethnic groups being excluded from the centrist government, from um, government which they could feel they had a share in, that they could have their own language use, but equally um, have access to the natural resources of the country. And so very often what happens, most often what happens is when people feel that depth of um, exclusion, they take up some kind of weapons to address the balance. And so I think the role of peace builders is more importantly to try and catch that or to identify it, to name it, to work on it, before it becomes violent. I think we still have a lot to learn about how we do that. Um, but then equally, once we're really aware of it, like we've seen in Afghanistan and Myanmar this past year, to really start looking at then who needs to work together. And I think something um, that uh, we actually, we, we've spoken earlier today about is the assumption I think we should be careful of is that we can't immediately move people into some kind of peace talks across a table sort of facilitation where mediators fly in from somewhere else and push people towards peace agreements and most particularly i think a very common narrative these days is to try and push people towards a ceasefire in order to to bring about some agreement so so our job is partly analysis it is partly identifying the very key players and and things that are driving a conflict, but um, trying to desegregate that from from what is violence, and then looking at how do we start to yeah to bring those players together. But 
I think it's um, it's something that we haven't come to terms with yet in the 21st century is the complexity of that conflict system that we're dealing with now. And I think we've seen that in Syria, in Yemen, in many other places. But often we're treating conflicts as if they're out there away from the West or away from developed societies. But actually we're seeing more and more that geopolitics, regional economics and so on is all inter interconnected into conflicts. I don't know if that's true for you, Yalda, um, and how you see it in Afghanistan, but I think that's certainly something that we've been grappling with about the Myanmar situation is that it's not just a Myanmar conflict. There are regional dimensions to it. Um, I think we're seeing big powers now playing into those um, Myanmar is a country that has so many resources, $38 billion worth of jade, $25 billion worth of um, gas and oil moved across the country every year. So there are really high stakes in some of these conflicts that we need to come to terms with them, which we often don't see. Um, partly, if I may, Yelda, that sometimes the media portrays it as, you know, um, one military versus one great person, but actually that's much more more complex than that. Uh, absolutely. And and I just want to pick up on two points that you've made. Um, you know, the first one, um, when you just talked about uh, Cambodia really being sort of a, um, an example of where a nation can get to. Um, so, you know, when you walk through the killing fields in Cambodia, it is a reminder of, of the horrors of a nation. And, and you, you realize, actually, despite those horrors, there can be some kind of resolution at the end of it. And when you look at a conflict like Afghanistan's, where we talk about, you know, 40 years of, of conflict, 40 years of warfare, 40 years and now entering sort of almost the fifth decade um, of, of generation after generation being impacted. Um, you know, I, I remember watching the fall of Kabul and speaking to my parents and realizing that they hadn't actually dealt with their own trauma of, of almost 40 years ago when they fled uh, following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, that as a, a family that had become um, immigrant immigrants to Australia, they did what all immigrant families do, and that's just get on with it. Raise a family, you know, send their children to school, get a job, get re-educated and not actually deal with the trauma of what they had just experienced, you know, having to be uprooted and, and, and leave a conflict. And it was only when um, I saw my mum and dad uh, sort of really relive their own trauma of 40 years ago through what was happening in Kabul on the 15th of, of, of August and, and seeing another generation of Afghans being displaced and not knowing what their future holds. You realize that, that you know, some of these things can remain unresolved for decades and that's really part of the problem. I wonder though, you know, in a conflict like Afghanistan's after 9-11, whether there was what your assessment is because when that Bonn conference happened and, you know, the various different factions and sides in Afghanistan uh, came together uh, to talk about the future of a nation and importantly, the Taliban were left out of that conversation. Were there opportunities in those years after when the Taliban hadn't reformed as an insurgency to really reach out to them and say, OK, well, look, this this has happened. Uh, you know, there's the fall of your regime. You've, you're all now on the run. But is this now a time to come and talk when they were willing uh, to, to have that conversation rather than sort of waiting eight or nine years, um, you know, when the Americans decided, OK, we, we want out of this nation. The Taliban had already formed a violent insurgency. And here we are today where, in many ways, both sides feel like they've lost. So, you know, what was built over two decades feels like it's lost. And the Taliban themselves, in my conversations, in my recent trip to Kabul just a month ago, speaking to Taliban authorities who, who said to me, we didn't want it to end this way. You know, we didn't expect Kabul to fall the way it did. We were at the gates of Kabul and we rang the Americans and we asked them who will take control of Kabul, who will secure the city now that the president has fled. And they said, well, it's over to you boys. And so he, the, the Taliban have said to me, we entered reluctantly to prevent the looting. But what happened then was out of fear and distrust of the Taliban, you know, the, the 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 best and brightest of a nation fled, and alongside them, this sort of, you know, this 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 um, sort of collapse of institutions that we continue to see in the country. 
Yeah. I think you're um, picking up. Oh, sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. Well, no, I just um, before you get into the sort of current context in, in, in Afghanistan, I think you raise a really important point, Yalda, going back to the Bonn conference about what does victory mean? in a conflict and and whether those who are in a position of military ascendancy are able to be generous in reaching out so that it's not a question of victory and defeat but a question of how do you actually construct an outcome that means people are less inclined to want to persist with more violence as a way of getting what they want and i know that's something you've seen emma in myanmar it's something we've seen in the philippines where i think there was a recognition of the need to build something together rather than to constantly look for what you could get for yourself alone. Right. And I I think what both of you are touching on is something which I think is really important in peace building is the narrative that we tell out of the past. And so um, we, we are, we're talking about traumatised societies, but we're also talking about deeply resilient societies and societies that have navigated waves and waves of external influence um, and yet who are still finding ways to go forward. And so one of the things that we've done in Cambodia is to build a, a peace museum which tells the new generation how did peace happen? And it focuses not on what has traditionally been taught to young Cambodians, which is this terrible genocide, but the years and years of what it took to build a peace agreement, and that's 50 plus meetings between different sides and different factions. That's then building a new constitution and having buy-in from all of the people. That's how do we then have elections that are free and fair? And then how do we hold on to that? And I think that's something that we all have to work a lot harder at is drawing out what is the the resilience the compassion the leadership the ability of people to be able to take a society forward and i think that's something we've been trying to highlight in cambodia recognizing that conflict never really goes away it's always i think deep below the surface and something that we have to continue to work on generationally but most certainly we want to try and avoid it coming to violence and i think um jonathan you're alluding to the to the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in the Philippine government. And that particular moment where they both realized that this was untenable and unsustainable, that they actually couldn't keep fighting each other um, for economic reasons as much as for nationalist reasons, for um, the way that the world perceived them and that part of the Philippines as Mindanao as this, this terrible place, but equally, to connect into the real politic that Yalda's um, alluding to is these security complexes that we've had since 9-11. And so this notion that we bring in an army to Iraq or to Afghanistan, um, that we have counter-terrorism, that we go out and we try to identify these evil people in our midst and then try to arrest them, crush them, imprison them, which actually has built a less secure um, community, world, environment, whatever we want to say. So I think we really need to review some of that, that policy that came out of 9-11 that said, we'll come out and get them, you're with us or against us. That's, that's not seeing the human, that's not um, being our best, uh, bringing out the humanity and dignity in each of us. President Aquino in the Philippines had that election moment where he said, I will bring peace to this place. Chairman Murad, the head of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front said, yes, we will make the peace process over everything else. We'll pursue it and pursue it and pursue it. Now, it wasn't an easy task. Some say 17 years, some say 13 years. I had the privilege of serving in that peace talks for four years. And it, it's not easy to build peace, but it's far superior than trying to crush a conflict and control it till such a moment as you can't keep your troops there any longer and you withdraw, as we saw in Kabul, and then the whole thing comes to the surface again. So, so we did end up with I mean, a comprehensive you, agreement. We you, did end I up mean, with a comprehensive point. agreement in the Philippines. And, and today the focus is on how do we implement that, build that, um, create a new society and a new vision. And I think that's that's where we want to be refocusing 
energy and people in each of these situations. Jonathan, go ahead. Sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you're pointing to courageous leadership, which I think is a really important component. I, I know from talking with you, Yalda, that by talking to people in Afghanistan about what they're trying to do now, how they're trying to survive in the face of the Taliban, but what their hopes are and some of the courageous steps they're taking to actually gradually try and assert some space to hold on to who they've become over, over the last 20 years. I wonder if you can help us get beyond some of the statistics of Afghanistan into the real life experience of people who are who are trying to think, well, what might it look like to build peace at some point in the future, given the huge setbacks that have happened? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I just want to pick up on a point that um, Emma made about, you know, sending in big armies to these places without actually understanding the complexities of of a society, without fully understanding and grasping, um, you know, the, the, the various different dimensions, that it's not black and white. So, for example, I went uh, to Helmand, to Sangin, um, which was basically one of the most dangerous places on Earth at, at, at one point, where the, the highest number of Marines were killed and and a third of British forces that, uh, throughout the 20-year uh, conflict were actually killed. So it was actually considered the most deadly, dangerous place on earth at one point. And yet I travelled by road, you know, just about a month ago uh, from Kandahar to Helmand, um, which took about two and a half hours, escorted by the Taliban, uh, you know, to, to these communities who are now rebuilding uh, their homes, the homes that had experienced aerial bombardments day and night, um, because, uh, you know, the, the, the coalition forces, the Afghan forces were looking for uh, these monsters, the Taliban who lived in these homes. And the local population and local community ha were forced uh, to become uh, you know, internally displaced uh, for many, many years. And now they've returned back into their communities. Many of the young men I met said they either had to join the insurgency because they were fed up of, of wedding halls and homes being bombarded, um, or they were just, you know, caught in the crossfire, angry about what was happening um, and, and, and angry at the central government. But, but I, I think, you know, um, to the point about about leadership and and that's something that we're now seeing that's really sort of almost missing in Afghanistan because on the one hand you do have a sense of peace and security i can travel now to kandahar i can go to helmand i can travel by road uh, to many parts of the country that were considered absolutely deadly and and it would have been unthinkable for me to go to but is that enough does that mean that the people who have been offered security and peace also have freedom. And so when we talk about, you know, these these uh, millions of people now who are, are trying to return to normal life, I mean, you know, I spoke to members of the Shia community who feel threatened day and night. They say to me that, you know, the Taliban have become the new Ghani government and ISK or, or ISIS in Khorasan um, uh, has become the new Taliban uh, targeting minority communities across the country. Women feel completely um, pushed out and, and, and on the fringes of society. It, it, they, they don't exist, actually, in places like Helmand and, and Kandahar. I was very much the only woman in, in many parts of, of, of the country when I was traveling to rural Afghanistan. Even in Kabul, um, it, it, is, it feels like a city occupied. And, and I take Emma's point about you can't rush people you know, to, to peace negotiations and peace talks. But what I do feel hopeful about is that while the Taliban are, or, or uh, you know, are known to be an authoritarian um, regime, and 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 they have a certain type of ideology, it doesn't feel, or at least we haven't seen the kind of bloodbath, the kind of crackdown that we saw in the '90s, which means, in many ways, in the last 25 years, lessons on their part, for the leadership at least, have been learnt. And so how do you capitalise on these lessons? 
if we look at the yeah. foot soldiers and the rank and file, for example, they may be detaining young women and cracking down and entering homes and doing things that the leadership say that they shouldn't be, you know, and, they, and the promise of no revenge attacks, the promise of no reprisals, allowing people like Hamid Karzai, the former president of the country, to remain in the city, allowing people like Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, uh, you know, the, the, the former CEO of, of the country, um, a prominent politician who fought against the Taliban in the 90s to remain in the country, allowing people like Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, who was known as the butcher of Kabul, to remain in the country, even though certain leaders like Ghani and, and, and those around him have left, there are still people who have, have remained. How do you capitalize then without rushing to the peace negotiations? How do you, with the Taliban 2.0, how do you now deal with them when we aren't seeing, for example, you know, when I said to the Taliban, for example, yes, but there are people living in fear at the moment. They said, yes, but there were half a million government workers. We haven't killed half a million people. There are incidents, sure. There are people doing things, uh, you know, outside of, of Kabul in the rural areas. And we are trying to crack down on that. How do you capitalize yeah. on that? That's sort of my big question to to you, Emma, and you, Jonathan. You know, um, there is this moment and, and it could go either way. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is such an interesting question because I think one is we talk these days about peace process and I think we always focus on the peace part, but it is a process. And I loved what you said about none of these things are monolithic. And I think we tend to treat everything very black and white, but it seems to me like it's the nuances and the details that matter. But I was really encouraged to hear the Indonesian foreign minister speaking recently about her effort um, to reach out to the Taliban, to work with Qatar, um, to be providing aid, but also to be focusing in on education, principled, valued, uh, values-driven Islamic education. And I think there are incredible opportunities now for, for pluralistic countries like Indonesia, predominantly Islamic, to be able to lean in. And I think those of us in the West need to really review um, how do we approach these things? Let's get behind a country like Qatar, like um, Indonesia, and really um, promote that engagement. I also want to throw in here, um, I think we've got locked into some ways of doing things. And it's interesting that um, you're describing people that have committed crimes, being tolerated, being allowed to, to, to you know, exist, um, stay on, continue, whatever. And I think um, justice, in a sense, is also a process. And I think we talk a lot about transitional justice, but I would really hope as a, as a peace field, as a global family, we start talking more about transformative justice. And for me, that means how do we um, reinvent the relationship, what, rebuild the relationships, but relationships that are built on, on just ways of being together, on rights, on principles, on values. And one of the things that I'm excited about, which we've sort of alluded to a couple of times, is the extraordinary young people around the world now who are bringing that into the conversation. And it's the Greta Tronbergs, it's the Malalas, it's the Joshua Wongs in Hong Kong, it's the incredible young people that led the civil disobedience movement in Myanmar who are uncompromising in their commitment to a new vision, a, 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 a rights-based but values-driven approach, um, who don't want to buy into temporary measures, um, compromise, whatever, whatever. They're really looking at building new societies and they're all about non-violence. They're about bringing everybody along. They can tolerate words like self-determination they talk about power sharing and wealth sharing. They're really interested in solidarity. And so sometimes I think one of the best things we could all do is get out of their way and let them let them lead. But I am excited. And in particular, I think what I would call a feminist model of leadership, which isn't just about women being at a table, women's leadership. It's actually about a model of leadership that's about sharing power that we do this together. It's about putting ego aside. It's about having empathy, um, being critical, analytical, being political, but it is about doing it together inclusively. And so, yeah, I think 
young people, particularly young women, are really, really the, the possibility that we have to be able to transform Afghanistan, Myanmar, the United States. I mean, let's face it, these are, these are not just countries in the South that are facing significant um, violent conflict at the moment. Yeah, I mean, we're here, we're seeing this with the sanctions, right, um, that have uh, been imposed on, on the junta in Myanmar and, and the Taliban in Afghanistan. Punishing these regimes does not actually punish the regimes, it punishes the population. So you've now got, you know, Jonathan said, uh, give a face to these statistics. When we talk about, you know, 3 million starving Afghan children or 23 million people on, on the brink of starvation or the march towards starvation, as the UN would say, these are all people who, frankly, in the last, you know, 20 years may have been poor, and may have been facing poverty, but we weren't seeing the kind of numbers and the kind of starvation that we are seeing today as a result of these sanctions and the freezing of funds and the collapse of the economy and the uh, collapse of the central bank and, and the lack of access to funds that the, currently, the country currently faces. There is plenty of food on the shelves. Um, there is just no money to buy that food. And so we have a population who is inc that is increasingly becoming frustrated, that is increasingly becoming hungry. And, and how long before what we think is our values needs to be imposed on a, a regime or an ideology turns into frustration and anger of a local population, which leads to the complete collapse of a society, which means that, you know, people are marching in the streets, demanding things from their government, because whether the Taliban like it or not, they are the de facto government, they are in control and they are accountable to their people. But if, if, if you know, if their funds are being frozen, if access isn't being given to uh, donors to be able to properly work and function inside the society. It's almost like this vicious cycle that we feed into. And how much do we need to reform as societies in our understanding of the tools that we use in order to negotiate and deal with these societies or these new regimes, um, but, but not punish the actual local population. And we're seeing that in places like Iran, for example, even in, in places like Russia, the, the, the people at the top, you know, almost bulletproof um, uh, their own systems against the sanctions. But the, the population is what's most affected. And, and, what, and they're the ones that, that become angriest. And that's what destabilizes whole societies. And so, Yelda, you're touching on something that I think is critical is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there is a place for some types of sanctions in certain situations. But what I understand about the current sanctions on Afghanistan is that they're sanctions that came with the previous iteration of Taliban that we've never gotten rid of. And this speaks to the fact that we're not great at being flexible and responsive and and changing and having comprehensive approaches to these moments of, of extreme violence or extreme violent conflict. And so, in effect, we needed to very quickly review the types of sanctions that were on Afghanistan. In Myanmar, um, of course, targeted sanctions on certain people within the military leadership have worked, but they have to be part of a comprehensive strategy. So if the EU just puts sanctions, but it's not connected to any other part of the effort to make the change, then yes, it's sort of isolated and meaningless. If we can work together better as an international community about the pressure plus the um, facilitation to change, the people making the change as much as the external actors, then I think we have a better chance of not punishing people, but actually getting to the end that we want quicker. I think for that to happen, we have to stop treating each other um, again, monolithically. So we have to work out how to engage, for example, with China in the Security Council. And um, there are certain perceptions of China in the West that means they think like this, they think like that, and vice versa. And I think it's really time, um, if we're going to see the human, so to speak, is to really move beyond these political narratives that we have and start really um, exercising our preventative diplomacy muscle and looking at where is their commonality? What is the shared interest here? Nobody in the Asia region wants this Myanmar situation. It is out of control. It's affecting economies. There's refugee flows, um, obviously COVID, da-da-da-da-da. And so China doesn't want that. 
ASEAN doesn't want that, India doesn't want that. And so there's a huge space for commonality there. And so we really need to start pulling together and looking pragmatically at what can be done rather than assuming that this is how they think and this is how they think. And I think that'll be a big shift in that how we can collaborate around sanctions and a joint, a joint strategy from the Security Council all the way through to how we deliver humanitarian aid in a complex conflict environment. I think you're delving into a fascinating area of how you balance sanctions as a punishment and incentives to in support processes of change. And I want to actually bring in one of the questions that we've had, uh, which I think is a really pertinent question to our peace building vision, because we're talking about seeing the human and how people who are living in communities can bring about change without only having to hope for or rely on political leadership. And so we've got a question that asks us, how do, you, how do we try and ensure that local peace efforts, peace efforts in the communities themselves, are not overrun? And that, that, so that's one element of the question. How do we support the agency of the people who are trying to bring about change themselves? But you were also earlier on, Emma, talking about how we learn lessons from different places. So how do we help people who are in that position trying to bring about change in their societies to indeed learn from some of the bitter experiences elsewhere so that they, they don't repeat mistakes that others have had to endure? I think, I mean, fundamental to your question is listening and not just listening what do people want, but putting national actors or, as you described it, community-based peace efforts, the movement for change, front and centre to whatever strategy that we have. And so to make any external intervention into a conflict, and I think this is what we're talking about back to 9-11, but um, equally in Myanmar today, without listening deeply to how the people, what the people want, but then also how, what kind of change, and using them as the monitoring feedback system to any peace negotiation, peace process, which is what um, conciliation resources help to facilitate in the Philippines, was along the journey of negotiations, continuing to hear from civil society groups, um, NGO leaders, religious leaders, but people themselves and communities. Is this going in the direction you want? What 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 else is missing? What are you not, what's not being picked up here? Um, I'll give you an example of that is at the moment in the Philippines, the pe the communities are saying, well, wait a minute, the, the transitional justice and reconciliation components are being neglected. So we're talking a lot about disarming this group and that group, but we're not actually acknowledging the injustices of the past. And that means our dignity is is being um, taken away from us. It's not we're not being respected. What happened in the past to us has to be acknowledged for us to be able to go forward into the future relationship. So national, I mean, the UN calls it national ownership. Um, we call it community based efforts that has to be the primary accountability mechanism. But then all of these things get layered on around it. And I think this is the challenge, because that's the kind of role that people like me and my team and others, we do now is trying to connect those dots is how do we make sure people on the ground are connected to the UN envoy connected to countries that are making an effort to the EU sanctions to this one and that one. That's a that's a more complex job than we used to have. I think back in the days when we had the Aceh agreement, there were two two sides of the table, and and it was a lot easier um, without social media, without all of this connectivity that we have. But that's what we're dealing with. And Jonathan, if I may. I think that means that those of us who work for peace are going to have to work better together because none of us um, can single-handedly bring about peace to a complex conflict situation as we know it today. And that's why collaborations like ours, partnerships with others, open communication, transparent efforts for peace, um, a willingness to realise that different ones of us have different expertises, networks, access, um, is a really critical way to be working. So I think of it as a web of mediation. Um, I think of it as mediatable moments where different ones of us can step in. 
but it really means that we have to more humbly find ways to to come together it's not like um ngo coordination it's actually a kind of ability to see um, how a machine can work very smoothly together as a system entering into that system and bringing our positivity our energy but also that comparative experience as you described it can i just pick up on the local uh question um because i think this is something that um uh, you know, many people in Afghanistan on a local level capitalized on over the last two decades. If we took a, talk about what went wrong on a local level, you had local disputes. And so what people would do is go to the authorities or the coalition forces and say X, Y, and Z is a member of the Taliban, when in fact it might have been some kind of local dispute and it was just easier to pin them as the insurgent or the enemy or the terrorist or, you know, someone that um, needed to be outcast. And so rather without fully understanding or grasping the issues that those local communities had with each other, whether it was one tribe or another, um, you know, they would take a very black and white approach detain someone and then that built resentment within that community towards the coalition forces towards the afghan national army and so if we were to step back now you know and look at say certain provinces for example where girls are allowed to go to school those sorts of issues have not been resolved through the central government in kabul or through those in in power in in kabul those issues have been resolved through the tribes through mediators through educators through people who have spent time understanding the complexities of the tribes and may and reach some certain types of compromises so for example you know girls go to school at a certain time and other and boys go to school at another time or change um you know the environment or whatever it is that might meet the requirements of the local community reaching that kind of compromise rather than putting a sort of blanket uh you know um a, a sort of idea over the country you won't allow girls to go to school and therefore we're going to punish you via sanctions trying to understand what the needs of each of those communities are to reach that kind of resolution and compromise to be able to reach the goals that we want is which might be to get girls into schools for example but taking into consideration the environment and that the environment can't change overnight for example and Yaldo, what you're also touching on there is what I would call oversimplification of the problem. And I think without being, uh, without knowing significantly about Afghanistan, but observing how we, we treated the participation of women on Afghanistan is um, we'll give them a few days, we'll bring 50 women together um, outside the country and they have to come up with what is the position of women on the, on the talks. I mean, how can women from different groups, different parts of the country, different education backgrounds and so on, um, simplify their issue in three days um, to be inserted into the talks like that? We, we completely treated um, those kinds of issues as if it was very, it was men versus women in Afghanistan. And I think we really um, failed them in that sense. I think the other thing is what I remember about Afghanistan and the Afghans that I studied peace building with back in back in the mid 90s was that there was an incredible peace network. Um, people that were negotiating with the Taliban from Peshawar back then, um, helping to find ways to get aid into the country. And the minute that all of those outside forces came in and all that money flooded, it was really eroded. Those NGOs, the civil society networks and so on, um, were really spoiled by some of that money. And there are many people who feel disillusioned today about how that happened, um, but also what was lost in terms of the fabric and ability to be able to handle that. And I think that's something that we all need to learn from Afghans about what was that about? I think we all need to do a lot more reflection and thinking about where we missed opportunities and where we imposed outside ideas about what needed to happen. I mean, this is, it's, it's wonderful listening to the conversation evolve. I do want to bring in a couple more questions because we're getting some fascinating questions from our audience. And maybe I could put one to you that, that we've been, that's been touched on in what you've already said uh, around how important it is to prosecute the perpetrators of crimes against humanity in order to achieve peace. And I think this is one of the most critical issues in, in 
so many peace processes, but how do you grapple with the violations that have happened? Where do you draw a line in order that you can move forward? You can't forget about what's happened, but you do need to move forward. And I think this is something that we see in many places, and it's an issue that, that Afghanistan is going to have to deal with in regard to the Taliban, but in regard to um, what's happened over the past two decades. And, and how do we bring justice into the equation? Wait, will Yalda jump in? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's yeah. Please go ahead. For me, it's not it's not one size fits all. I think it goes back to again listening very deeply to what does justice mean to those that were um, affected by by the conflict, by dictators, by leaders, whatever. Um, and I think um, that's something that obviously we've had to grapple with in Cambodia is. Is it the Khmer Rouge era that is the most violent? How do we how do we do we just boil Cambodia's past down to those three years? And is it just five people who perpetrated a genocide? Or were there other geopolitical dimensions? Were there other driving factors that need to be named and acknowledged for us to really be able to help the next generation understand um, what happened? And so I think justice. I mean, yes, obviously we need to, to continue to persecute particular um, crimes, but I think we have to be able to look at that in the context of the implication of how we help a society go forward without compromising. Um, that sounds very, very simple, but I think it's a, it's a complex issue. I remember one Moro Islamic Liberation Front leader telling me what justice looked like to him. And he said, number one, I need the president to apologise for the decades and decades that my people were excluded um, and not recognised and given their rights. And the second is we're asking for just political autonomy. If we can have that, oh, I, I don't need every last general and every person who perpetrated or fought against us to be trialled, I would feel that justice was done. So I think justice has a very different notion um, in different cultures, different religious spaces and so on. So it comes back for me to listening to what people want and what would satisfy them in order to help a society move forward and to prevent future conflict. I think that's critical. I don't know if that's true in Afghanistan and Yelda and you see it the same way. Yeah, and, and I think if you look at the 40-year conflict in Afghanistan, there are certain characters and there are certain people who continue to re-emerge in the country. And, and whether that was, uh, you know, um, uh, the people who came out uh, who were supporters of the Soviet-backed government that committed their own atrocities against the local population, um, whether that was members of the Mujahideen. Um, and, and I just mentioned um, uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, who uh, was described as the butcher of Kabul. And, and, and his forces were known to bombard uh, the centre of, of Kabul day and night. And, and uh, people say that, you know, he had blood on his hands and or whether that was members of the Taliban when the Taliban were in power. And, and for many members of the Taliban, the last two decades, the kind of atrocities they feel were committed against their, um, uh, you know, uh, supporters, as well as members uh, who, were, who were part of their um, uh, insurgency. At every twist and turn, despite the trauma that the Afghan people have continued to face and the, despite the ongoing uh, conflict of the last 40 years, these certain characters have been able to become part of society. So Hekmatyar was brought back to Kabul several years ago and he was allowed to peacefully live back, uh, you know, in society with certain conditions. Um, you know, other members who were considered um, warlords, uh, for example, have lived peacefully in, in the city um, and, and, and in the country and, and been able to be active politically or otherwise. So there, the Afghan people, as you say, Emma, are incredibly resilient, like so many other societies. They are able to overcome some of those traumas um, despite uh, many of these people uh, causing a lot of bloodshed and horror in the country. So they do have the ability uh, to, to forgive and to uh, have a process of reconciliation, um, despite you know, what they may have gone through over 40 years. And I think just to add to that, Yelda, um, something 
Well, one one question that I think we should ask more often is what justice, not what justice do we bring to others, but what was our part in this mess? And I think in relation to Afghanistan or Myanmar, all of us can ask that question is what was our part in the mess? What did we neglect to do? What how did we um, how did we respond wrongly? How did we use particular countries for our own self interest or or whatever? But something else that I've learned from Cambodians um, is is not necessarily to seek the forgiveness or to to name who was right or wrong, but to get in touch with that deep compassion that you find after such violence and such bloodiness. And um, and they talk about after after you've been through um, carpet bombing, after you've been through a genocide, after you've fought each other day in and day out for four, for 10 years, um, there is nothing left but compassion. There is nothing left but humanity, that we're not interested to continue this ongoing um, hyped drama and, and violence. We do want to dig deeper into ourselves and to be more human and to, to raise our children differently and to be future focused, not past focused. And I think that's a really interesting component um, in Cambodian life today is young people are saying, let's talk about our future now. And we do have this narrative around dealing with the past, but in some ways they see the past as their future. And I think it's a really hard concept for white, simple white people like me to get our heads around. But uh, it's a notion of time that is past, present and future all in one. And so we we obviously have our past inside of us, but we also have the possibility to invent a new future. And and I think what Jonathan said earlier is often we think these conflicts are in faraway uh, places that don't impact us. But I think what we fail to understand that in these faraway places, people have the same hopes and dreams for their families, for their children, uh, for their own livelihoods, um, that, that, you know, culturally they may be different, but their aspirations and dreams remain the same. And I have those very same conversations that I might have with my girlfriends or people I know in, in London or in Sydney. Uh, and I have those conversations with, with friends in places like Baghdad or Sanaa or uh, Kabul, um, you know, that their concerns remain the same for the safety of their children, for the future of their children, for their own future. Um, and, and they want a safe, prosperous environment to live in. Um, and, and I suppose that's why you have so many young women, so many young people in Afghanistan or Myanmar, you know, out in the streets protesting, putting, the, putting their own lives at risk day in, day out. And I've spoken to these young people in, in Myanmar on air uh, where they said to me, we value democracy. I'd rather die uh, than have my freedom taken away. And that is a concept that I suppose would be really difficult for us to fully understand and grasp um, because it's not something that is necessarily at stake where we are. But but I'm also reminded through my work um, that, that no one has a monopoly on, on civilization. No one has a monopoly on freedom. That these things can be taken away from us um, if we don't safeguard them in our own societies, no matter where we are. Um, and so I'm often in awe when I see these young women in Afghanistan who want to appear on camera, for example, who want their full names, knowing that um, that m might put them at risk and danger and they they go out yeah. onto the streets daily uh, because of the bravery that they show. And they, they've said to me, I've never lived under the Taliban. My mother lived under the Taliban and it's not a life that I want for myself and I'm willing to risk my life for it. And I, and I found the same in, in, in Myanmar when I spoke to those young demonstrators as well. And yeah, so I... creative, so creative <laughs> in their way that they do it's that. Incredible. So creative, I found them incredible, yeah. I, I don't want to interrupt, but at the same time, we've got a question that's come in that I think is very pertinent to what you've just been saying, Yalda, about your work as a journalist and, and hearing the stories of people who are showing this courage and who are prepared to put their lives at risk. And, and I know that you and I have spoken about the way that you as a, a woman have been able to report in Afghanistan and, and the, the balancing act you have to navigate in speaking truth to the power of the Taliban and 
faithfully reporting the stories that you're hearing. And so one of the questions that's um, come up and that a lot of people have been uh, sort of ticking is, is what role do you think the media can play in, in preventing and resolving conflict, not just in, in telling the story of what's happened, but is there a role for the media to actually prevent and resolve conflict? Yeah, and, and I think what we do, uh, Jonathan, as you know, is is, is uh, hold uh, these various different people who are in power accountable. Uh, so, for example, today, um, when when the finger of blame is being pointed at the Taliban uh, for 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 abducting these women, I had the Taliban on air. You know, I'm I'm putting those questions of the demonstrators and the women concerned and the activists and the human rights uh, groups uh, to those who are. Uh, responsible. Now, whether or not the Taliban are uh, the ones behind the abduction of these women, the point is that they are in charge. So they should be investigating and finding out who is. And so to have these different voices and people on air, we're giving the opportunity uh, for all sides to hear each other out, as difficult and as painful for the various different sides it may be to, to hear from, uh, you know, the other side, to hear from the so-called enemy. Um, it does give them the opportunity to, to, to listen, to discuss. Um, and, and as Emma says, the most important thing in all of this is to listen and to then be able to have a dialogue even if they are screaming at each other on social media, it's still dialogue, it's still a conversation, it's still the ability uh, to be able to listen to what the other side has to say, uh, rather than just accept that this is, this is what's going to happen to you. And for uh, the authorities in Afghanistan to know that the, the, uh, the media is going to hold them accountable, that the world is watching, even when it appears like they're not, even when you, know, you, have, you have accusations that the media has, has forgotten Afghanistan and has, isn't listening. These sorts of conversations does, does make a difference and we are holding them accountable. And I have said to the Taliban that I'm not here to make anyone look good. I'm only here to report the truth. So whether it's good or bad, we will report it. You're either part of that conversation um, or, you know, we do it without you. Well, and I, I would dare to say that, I mean, there's probably no one truth. And the beauty of people like Yalda is her investigative journal journalism capacity is actually doing what we spoke about earlier, is m moving beyond a monolithic understanding of the Taliban, moving beyond. So by telling stories, um, and giving humans authenticity and diversity and a, a rich colour of what a society or, or, um, or, or different viewpoints are, you're actually moving beyond this notion that all Taliban's are like this and all Afghan women are like that. And I think that's, going, that's an absolutely critical role that the media plays and one where we really need to invest more in, in that kind of investigative journalism that gets deeper into things. Because I, I actually don't believe that there is one. I think there are always multiple truths and, and that's why there are you know, multiple needs for justice because, um, yeah, many people come into conflict out of poverty. Sometimes that's actually the least of them, but out of a sense of lack of dignity, being excluded, not having access to what they need, not being heard. And so the media has a critical role to play in that. And grateful for Yalda that she can go down the road and show us that Helmand province is a different place today than it was. That's, that's changing narratives and stereotypes and perceptions. And I think that's actually even more critical than, than, um, you know, speaking truth to power. I think that's actually, um, creating an authentic voice, a real voice and a diverse lot of voices and stories that, that then we can all um, benefit from, but also be challenged by. Yeah, and humanizing. I I, 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 sorry, go ahead, Jonathan. And I, no, I was I, just gonna I, say what- you go, you go, Yalda. I, well, I was just going to say, and, and humanizing. I, I, I think what the one thing I found from my most recent trip to Afghanistan is that, you know, many of the, uh, foot soldiers who are with the Taliban are, are young boys from rural parts of Afghanistan uh, who have fought since, um, you know, they were 10, 11 or 12 years old. Many of them haven't had a childhood. And so you find them in the theme parks of Kabul, you know, on rides. And, 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 and the idea of that felt 
sort of shocking to see initially because you've got these men with guns, you know, on in a theme park on a ride. And and when I would have these conversations, you you suddenly realize that actually many of them are children um, who aren't shaping the policies of the Taliban, but are somehow caught up in this conflict. And so how do you humanize that face and make the various other sides of this conflict and 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 uh, the the issues that have come out that that you know these young people also have their own aspirations and that's been stripped away yeah. from them as well and helping them and reconcile and understand that yeah and Yalda, you reminded me the very reason we as peace builders go to visit pyongyang and north korea is exactly that is to to meet ordinary everyday North Koreans and to listen to their stories about marriage and raising children and teenagers and, and all of those things and to never buy into the notion that one society is all robotic, is all um, of one way of thinking, is all um, is supportive of necessarily the leadership that speaks on their behalf. And I think that's really critical that both media but also peace builders do that, that we build bridges into spaces that other people don't ordinarily go, but then strengthen those bridges and make them more and more so that we as a, as a human race can be connected but not continue to perpetuate myths about one another. Um, most certainly those myths very quickly turn into weapons build-ups and then the kinds of standoffs and tensions we've seen throughout history. And so, yeah. We need each other, but think, let's move beyond the narrative. I think what you're getting at, Emma, is a critical part of the peace building work is building relationships because we, you're often dealing with authoritarian or dictatorial societies and regimes, but things are bubbling beneath the surface. And if you can build those relationships with people within the societies, when the geopolitics shifts, are you going to be able to seize new opportunities? And if you've just allowed societies to be closed off and if you've not engaged with them, it's ever so hard to actually seize those opportunities for change. Whereas this, if those relationships have been cultivated over time and, and you've got a sense of who the agents of change might be, you know how to support them and how to contribute to the process of change. I'm conscious it's that time's running got a couple more questions one that i think touches on what you're already what you've both spoken about at different moments in terms of the question of justice but also the question of truth and and how many truths are there and we have one question about the role of truth commissions in the process of peace and i wonder if you've got any thoughts on that emma particularly from the perspective of having seen how cambodia has, has you've told us a bit about how Cambodia's dealt with its past, but do you think truth commissions have a role in that? I mean, I think that we have a toolkit of a range of experiences from different parts of the world. So truth commissions, I mean, one of the most iconic is the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But I think sometimes the mistake we make is to think that there's a cookie cutter approach where we can take that into another place and simply apply it. And so I'm a big believer in homegrown solutions inspired by others' experiences, but that have to be right for the culture, the, the history, the particular types of conflict and violence that people have experienced and what makes sense for people. So in Cambodia, we've had a, a tribunal that's dragged on for some years, has cost hundreds of millions of dollars um, and has really only attempted to trial five people and some which are never going to be completed, I don't think the Khmer people feel that there's an overwhelming sense of justice out of that. That's not a truth commission. But my point is that I think, again, we need to go back to what makes sense for people. And truth commissions might work for some people in the society, but not everybody. So, again, we have to be really careful that we don't just apply a panacea this is the solution. If everybody goes through a truth commission, everybody will feel right, we can go forward. So I think we have to have multiple approaches. We have to listen to what people need. Um, obviously, we have to um, acknowledge the past and, and the different narratives that are there. And so again, a truth commission for me um, would need to be something 
that was able to accommodate a range of viewpoints, but would be something that people really felt helped them to move forward. I think um, we often I've heard before about the Polynesian example of justice, which is how everybody comes into a space and speaks their truth and all truths are acknowledged. That's a different notion to a commission which um, surfaces one one truth and only only one. So I think we need to, yeah, nuanced approaches and what works for people is fundamental. And just quickly, uh, just to add one more thing to that, just respecting that uh, local communities have their own mechanisms and tools as well. So, for example, in Afghanistan, they have um, uh, negotiating tools themselves, um, tapping into that and, and knowing how best they approach things. What, what are the mechanisms that they have up their sleeves? Same with places like Iraq and Syria. These communities and societies have mechanisms that they have used um, for, for centuries between the tribes, between the warring factions. So rather than imposing what we think is the best way and approach um, in dealing with them, help uh, better understanding their their system. So for example, in Afghanistan, you know, when you talk about uh, electing um, a, a, a government, um, whether that's one vote, one person, which I've put to the Taliban and various other people, they've said, well, we also have a lawyer jirga, for example, where where tribal elders come, uh, you know, with the decisions that their, their constituents have, have made, and they are representatives of that. So, you know, each of these societies, you, as you know best, um, have these tools and mechanisms. And, and how do we tap into that better? And how does the media then highlight those mechanisms? You know, what is our responsibility where we better understand these societies rather than assuming that our way is the best way? And Yelda, I learned that the hard way, um, living in Cambodia, being married to a Cambodian is in Cambodia, you you observe less, you, uh, you talk less, you observe more. And very often the message that you're being given or the reconciliation that's happening um, is going on through some meal that's happening, some symbolic gesture, some gift that's given, but not through the words that are spoken. And I think there's something that we we all should pay attention to more, maybe speak less, observe more. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to do that in 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 chairing today's conversation to to, to speak less and more. I hope, I, I hope I've succeeded, and 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 it's been absolutely fascinating here hearing the two of you talk about your experience. I I wish we could go on longer. There are still a couple of questions we haven't got to. I'm almost reluctant to pose them because they they are potentially so vast. But maybe a, a, a last question um, in, in, in less than two minutes. Um, I don't know how we do this, but I think it's such a pertinent question for where we are today in Europe, um, a real time challenge around what do we do about the looming conflict in Ukraine? Um, you know, know I, I, I interviewed, I, I mean, I interviewed the Ukrainian ambassador uh, to London yesterday. And he said to me, when I said, why now? Why is this becoming such a massive talking point now? He said, I don't know, you tell me. He said, it's because you, the media, have, have done various different reports. So it's all of us politicians are, are, are playing into whatever you have all highlighted. He said it, it was a New York Times report about uh, you know troops amassing on the border, when in fact, we've had this problem for seven years and those troops have been there since May at least. And he said, so, for us, the conflict hasn't ended. It's been going on for seven years. We've lost, you know, over 10,000 people. Uh, we face this threat on an ongoing basis uh, for, for many, many years. But but it, it's being ramped up for political reasons now. So he didn't describe it as an imminent attack, as a looming attack. He described it as we, the Ukrainians, being a nation caught up in this big geopolitical uh, discussion and conflict. And we are worried more than ever that, that some kind of deal is going to be struck you know, behind our backs between the United States and, and the Russians. So I, I, I think, you know, I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Emma to talk about more about how, you know, those sorts of nations, a smaller nation deals with the bigger geopolitical uh, crisis within the region. I, I think we'll have to leave that to, to another time, sadly, because we are out of time. But I think that that last point about people not having the space to talk for themselves, it's something we saw in Afghanistan with the Taliban and the Americans negotiating and, and, and the voices of people in Afghanistan. And we see it in all too many conflicts. And I suppose what we're hoping to do with this series as we progress through it 
is, as the series title says, see the human, hear the voices of the people who are experiencing the conflict and the voices of the people who are doing the, the creative things, many of which you've spoken about, Emma, to, to bring about change in their own communities. Um, I, I'm sorry that we can't hear more of you. You've both been absolutely wonderful, provocative and thoughtful and, and speaking from your own experience. And, and it's been a pleasure to hear what you've had to say. I also apologize to our audience that we've not been able to get to all the questions and that they could have been the, 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 the food for a whole symposium over several days. Um, we hope to be able to answer some more of these questions when we bring together future speakers. I'm hoping that we'll have a next episode in our series in March. Uh, we'll send you a note following today's uh, event and please do sign up for those of you who aren't on our mailing list, do sign up and uh, join us in the future. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Mel and Katie, for their hard work in, in, in making this all happen today. But most of all, huge thanks to you, Emma and Yalda. It's really been fascinating and a pleasure to, to hear your experiences and your thoughts today. So thank you, everyone. And I hope you all keep well. And I hope we'll be able to see you again in the future. Thank you.